Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So, hello everybody and welcome to Renovatio's podcast. Today we're really fortunate to have what I would consider really, I think, one of the great living historians and somebody who has made, I think, a major contribution, not just to uh, history, but also to the current contemporary political understanding, somebody who's very active as a blogger and who's written some really important books. I would put him in, in some ways, in that category of like people like Chris Hedges and others who've, I think, added their intellect to the uh, the discourse out there to help people navigate these incredibly difficult times. So we have Dr. Juan Cole, who has written an extraordinary book that when I read it, uh, when it first came out, I it was one of those books that I could not put down. And I, I read uh, I read through it, and I felt as if I was reading the Sira for the first time. That was, I think, what was so extraordinary about it. And as somebody who's been a student of Sira for probably 40 years, I think that really says something about the original research in it. So, Dr. Juan Cole, welcome. Thanks so much. Yeah, we're really happy to have you. Let me start out by just asking you a question about your methodology in approaching uh, Muhammad, Prophet of Peace, uh, amidst a clash of empires. It's it's a book that, in some ways, I think, and you have to correct me because I'm a dilettante in this area, but in some ways it seems that it's, it's working with a, a historical, critical methodology in that it's attempting to really place the uh, the Quran within the context of the historical events happening is that is that a correct assessment? Yeah, I think the book uh, benefited from uh, some uh, fairly recent uh, uh, developments in the study of the of that period of the of the seventh century of the Common Era on uh, the late Roman Empire. Uh, so a, a great uh, classicist, Glenn Bowersock, uh, wrote a uh, three-volume trilogy, really, on the Red Sea region and its relationship to the Roman Empire uh, from the 500s into the 600s. And in his last volume then dealt with Islam. And he, being a classicist and having spent his life studying the Roman Empire, uh, Greek and Latin sources, uh, was able to bring to bear uh, this extraordinary ability to contextualize uh, that period. And so I was very influenced uh, by Bowersock's uh, method, and uh, that was one of the things that I strove to do, was to set the Sira uh, in the world of, of, of late antiquity, of the late Roman Empire, uh, for, for from archaeological and uh, literary uh, texts. And, you know, the, the Sira writers themselves, uh, Ibn Ishaq and, and others, uh, aren't shy about saying that that was the world in which uh, the Prophet Muhammad lived. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I was able to cite their stories about him traveling up there, uh, but it's just that I fleshed them out uh, in in the way that modern historians now can amazing yeah and i think i think it's always it's very interesting that we we are all so indebted to the people of the past and and what they contribute that enables us to to move forward uh, one of the things that that i really like about the this is a little aside as somebody who's taught english and loves the english language and my, my father was a Shakespearean scholar. But one, my brother makes this argument that um, Herman Melville set out to, um, to write a book that had every English word in it. And what, one of the things that I really actually enjoyed about the book was just your language skills. I mean, I, I had to look up. I usually don't have to look up words, but I was looking up words all the time. So it's just a little aside there for people that want to uh, to uh, beef up their English vocabulary. It's it's a good book to do that with. Yeah, I, I didn't try to make the book difficult or anything, but 
I have to admit uh, that being a historian, uh, I've spent a lot of time with Victorians, uh, and uh, probably along the way I've, I've developed a distinctive vocabulary set. But I also really tried to use the words that would bring out the you know, the closest I could get to the original Arabic. Well, yeah, and that's that's what I thought. I mean, I, I thought, like, you used very technical terms about things like armaments and and things related to forts. And, and so I think people tend to forget how rich the English language is and how specific it can get. So le mot juste, uh, as uh, Flaubert said, finding that perfect word. Um, and I actually enjoyed some of the translations of the Quran because I, I, I noted that you, I think, used your own translations um, quite often. And I actually enjoyed some of your distinctions. So that, that was just an aside. But, you know, wh- one of the things that I find intriguing about Western scholarship very often, especially uh, some of the modern scholarship, uh, uh, Paul Ricoeur, he identified these, these two approaches to text. One is a kind of hermeneutic of devotion and the other was this hermeneutic of suspicion, which I totally get. And I think in, in the Islamic tradition, certainly the scholars of Hadith had a hermeneutic of suspicion mm-hmm. in their approach to the Hadith literature. But what I find is that it's not so much a hermeneutic of suspicion, but sometimes just a downright um, attitude that that it's all made up. And, and I think, I, you know, I've seen that just it's it's very surprising. One of the things I find in the Encyclopedia of Islam, um, it will it will quote hadiths that maybe don't always put Islam in the best of lights, and they always assume those are true. And then anything that really seems very very um, uh, positive, they'll say, well, this is obviously a fabricated hadith. I mean, I've seen that so many times, and I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit on that. Yeah, I, I really uh, don't go so much into the Hadith literature in this book. Uh, it is, as far as I could make it, uh, primarily based on the Quran itself. I and, and I think you uh, did an extraordinary job at that. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. I, you know, people say that often scholars will say that there's not much history in the Quran that is praises of God and so forth. But I think if you read it in a canny way, there's actually a fair amount in there uh, that uh, reflects on, on the life of the prophet and the people around him. Uh, it's just a matter of, of, of getting at it. Uh, and so, you know, we historians, uh, and this is, a, this is a problem for the field of the study of early Islam, we historians, uh, you know, really want primary sources. We want an eyewitness account, you know, if, if, uh, if somebody saw a riot and they went home and, and immediately wrote uh, an account of it, that's what we want. Uh, we don't want, you know, their memoirs from 30 years later. Oh, yes, when I was young, I saw this riot. Uh, and uh, that's not nearly as good. And we certainly don't want the grandchildren who heard the story of the riot. So the problem with the early Islamic history, and this is true of Christianity and and Judaism as well, uh, is it's hard to get at primary sources. The Hadith literature, the the Sira or biographical literature about the Prophet didn't get written down until uh, the Abbasid uh, period, uh, after uh, 750 of the Common Era. And it seems to have been uh, a custom or a belief uh, among the the early generations of, of Muslims that they shouldn't write things down, uh, that they didn't want to create you know competitors for the Quran. Right. Uh, and so things just circulated orally for 150 years. And uh, so uh, while that oral tradition is valuable and 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 there's a lot in there, you know, as a historian, you, you just don't know what to do with it. Whereas the Quran, because of early manuscript finds and carbon dating, I think we're increasingly, you know, uh, clear that the, that the academic world can agree with the, the traditional Muslim dating of the Quran, you know, roughly 610 to 632 of, of the uh, common era. 
And so that's a primary source. That's something a historian can do something with. It's what excites us. And so I really tried to focus in on the Quran. And, you know, from my own point of view as a, as a historian and as a student of religion, uh, if we have a, a hadith, a, a saying attributed to the Prophet Muhammad, my first question would be, well, you know, is it very much like what's in the Quran? Uh, and if it's not, then, then I, you know, I have doubts about it. Right. No, that's a really good, uh, good point. I think one of the things about your book that really struck me is because you did such a formidable job at contextualizing verses within the historical events that were happening, it really opened up to me some of these verses that I've read and even memorized uh, over the years and yet really hadn't seen what they what they were really addressing in a deep way at that time. And, and one example of that that really struck me was the verse about the, those who, um, who work towards the destruction of mosques and temples and, and, and churches and synagogues. And then, and then it says, when they should have really entered in, into them reverentially. And, and, and just placing that within the context of the, the Byzantine uh, and Persian War and the fact that the Jewish uh, alliance with the Persians uh, ended up, resulting in a lot of uh, aggressions against the Jews by the Byzantines, which still was relatively common throughout the history of um, certainly early Christianity and, and later Christianity, once it got into power. But I, I, that really struck me as something extraordinarily useful to students of the Quran. Well, thank you. Yes, I uh, I was very struck by that verse. It's it's uh, uh, Al-Baqarah, the, the cow, uh, to... 113 to 114, I translated as the Jews say the Christians have nothing to stand on, and the Christians say the Jews have nothing to stand on, even though they both recite the book. Those who are ignorant say the same thing. God will judge among them on the resurrection day regarding those matters over which they dispute. Who is more of a despot than one who forbids the mention of God's name in the houses of God and strives to tear them down? They should not have entered them save in fearful reverence. Their lot in this world is disgrace, and in the next they face severe torment. And when I read that, I, I was also at the time reading accounts, as you say, of uh, the war between the Iranians and the Romans of that time, in which you know, the religious groups often chose up sides. And so there were According to the Roman sources, uh, Jewish attacks on, on churches, there were uh, a whole range of Christian attacks on synagogues. Uh, and um, uh, it struck me when I read this verse uh, that, that that must be what the, the Quran was talking about. And it was condemning this outbreak of uh, communal violence, which uh, had its larger context in, in, in the Great War. Which I think today resonates with these terrible attacks on synagogues and and churches. What we've recently had uh, New Zealand that horrible event with the mosque and and then Sri Lanka the uh, terrorist Muslim terrorist attack on the Christian churches and then we've had a couple of synagogues in the United States with horrible uh, violence. So it's it's a, this seems to be a perennial problem that the Quran was addressing. Yeah, and the interesting thing to me about that verse also is that the Quran basically is chiding all sides. It's it's uh, it's not taking sides. It's saying, you know, these these houses of worship are for, are for God, and uh, they should be uh, exalted and uh, and kept away from that kind of violence. Nobody should enter them except in reverence. And he's talking, I think the verse is talking here about churches and synagogues. Uh, in the, you know, one of the things that happened uh, that made things difficult to understand in the Quran is that words shifted in their meaning over time. Right. In the Quran, uh, masjid uh, doesn't mean mosque. And if one thinks about it, of course, probably in the Meccan surahs, there were no mosques. Uh, and uh, it, it means a house of worship uh, or a temple. And, and I think it's 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 used to refer to the 
uh, to the Kaaba, to, uh, to the house of God in, in Mecca, but I think it's also used uh, to refer to really generically any, any uh, place of worship. Uh, and so some later exegetes, uh, Mufassirin, I think sometimes got mixed up because by their time, masjid meant mosque. Specifically and, and so a mosque, didn't, yeah. yeah. so they didn't quite, quite understand what the verse was driving at. Well, and there's a hadith to, I think, to buttress that argument that the Jews and the Christians made the, the graves of their prophets uh, masajid, you know, that they... Right, right. right. So I think that, that um, you know, one of the things that uh, you've written about, and I think it was in response to uh, Sam Harris, uh, which is just this idea of Islamic history. We, we forget that, that Gibbon actually, the Roman Empire <laughs> lasts into the 13th century, and Gibbon is writing about the Islamic, uh, the rise of Islam in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, and I think does a relatively decent job given the the paucity of of actual source material that he would have had available to him. But he, uh, you know, this idea somehow that Islamic uh, history uh, is not part of Western history, you know, that it's as if it's it's separate. And I think it denies the immense impact that Islam has had uh, in Spain, in... in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, but also just the the massive influence on on the Western uh, tradition itself. So, and I think uh, one of your colleagues, uh, Richard Bullitt, has obviously made an argument that really the West should be seen as the Judeo-Christian Islamic civilization. Um, what, what, maybe you could comment on that a little bit. Sure. Well, you know, in the late 19th century, the phenomenologists among the philosophers developed this idea of self and other and of the way in which people draw lines between what they conceive of as self and other. And uh, we historians, I think, uh, are often um, disliked because we're very much aware uh, of how those boundaries have changed over time. Uh, and people are very invested in their self and other boundaries. They don't like to see them broken down. Uh, but, of course, they are ridiculous because uh, all human beings are in contact with one another over time, civilizations, and uh, and how, how one draws those lines uh, changes uh, very rapidly sometimes. So, you know, people forget that the Roman Empire at its height was an empire of the entire coast of the Mediterranean. Mm. Uh, so it included what is now the Middle East. So if the this kind of fountainhead of Western civilization was the Roman Empire, well, it included Syria, uh, included Egypt. Uh, and indeed, uh, Syria provided emperors. Uh, they were, you know, Syrian elites were, were taken to Rome and, and became uh, became very powerful there. Uh, so th nobody at that time, you know, divided self and other uh, in, in those geographical ways as we now do between, say, Europe and the Middle East. It was all one thing. And in, in 212 of the Common Era, uh, the, the Roman Empire even made everybody citizens. Uh, so um, there was really no distinction between people who lived in Italy and people who lived in Syria with regard to uh, imperial law. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, I, I think the, the Christianity and Islam both grew up on the frontiers of the Roman Empire. Uh, Rome hadn't had Palestine very long uh, when Jesus taught, and it was still, uh, you know, there was a vassal state there. And uh, the Hejaz, where the Prophet Muhammad lived, was very much connected to the Roman Empire by trade and culture, uh, and uh, was just on its uh, tr frontier of Transjordan. So both are, are kind of Roman religions, but kind of also you know, have distinctive characteristics coming from, from their geographical setting in the Middle East. Right. But at that, at that time, nobody uh, drew lines of self and other in that way that we now do. Yeah, no, that's re it's a really good point. And I think that 
the 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 fact that Islam arose amidst the the really it was Christianized Roman Empire, but nonetheless it was still def, definitely an extension of Rome. And and the Prophet speaks very often of Rome. There are several hadiths where a Rome is mentioned, and in in some way, Arbery translated a Rome in the in the Quran as the the Greeks. Um, which to me is an interesting uh, translation and, and something that I think is appealing uh, in some ways. But it's also Ban al-Asfar. You know, it's very interesting that they were known as the, the yellow people, the children of, of uh, the color yellow, which I think is probably a, a more accurate description of Mediterranean whites um, than, you know, they're more olive-skinned peoples than, than they are... Um, you know, calling. I mean, white and black are just such problematic terms for people because there's nobody who's really black or, or white, with rare exception. But um, what what do you what do you when you see that arom, you know, uh, in the Quran? How do how do you how do you understand that? Well, uh, it, it is Rome, and you know, people uh, who were Greek speakers in the Eastern Roman Empire called themselves Romans uh, all the way uh, till the end of the Byzantine Empire in, in 1452. Uh, so Rome is the correct translation. And the prophet uh, does speak about Rome, and, and, and the Quran speaks about Rome. In fact, the Quran predicted that the Romans would win the war with, with Iran. Uh, right. And uh, so it's, it's very explicit uh, the way in which the Quran is taking an interest in that in that world of, uh, of, of, of the late Roman Empire. Uh, and I think, um, you know, there are verses of the Quran which uh, talk about uh, uh, the, the way in which God has made uh, people uh, of various hues and complexions and various uh, languages. Uh, and, and, and this is, you know, kind of a sign of, of God's greatness and something that we should be pleased with, uh, and so I, in in that chapter of Rome, uh, thirty twenty two, it says, and among His signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the variety of your languages and complexions. Surely in that are signs for all living beings. So the Quran is saying that just as natural uh, uh, natural phenomena. Uh, the heavens and the earth, the stars, the moon, are signs of of, of God uh, and mm-hmm. His creativity. So the variety of human languages and complexions are signs of God, right. and and and, and it, so it, it values them, it valorizes them in a very positive way. Mm-hmm. And you know, historians of the New Testament have also pointed to similar verses there, and have suggested that. Uh, the, the jostle of these languages and complexions is happening in the context of the Roman Empire. Hmm. Well, I've, I've always thought it was intriguing that that verse is in the chapter of Rome uh, in, in the, uh, the 30th chapter, because I, I, it seems to me that some of the later scholars identified Rome as generally meaning the Europeans as well. Um, and I've seen that in several commentaries on, on books. One of the uh, interesting hadith traditions that's in Sahih Muslim is, uh, is a hadith that the end of time will not come until the Romans of Rome are the majority of people. And Ahmed ibn Hanbal understood that to mean people would be behaving like them. So in other words, that culture would be the, the cultural norm of the vast majority of people on the planet. And, uh, and the hadith is Mustawrad al-Qurashis, uh, is, is the one who says it. And then Amr ibn al-As, um, who you know very well, it, uh, says to him, think about what you're saying. He says, I, I swear by God, I heard it from the Messenger of Allah. He said, if that's true, then they have four beautiful qualities. And then he... he uh, enunciates these qualities. He he said that they were the um, the people that recovered quickest from calamities, like natural disasters and things. And then he said they were the people that were the swiftest to come back to the fray of a battle after retreating from it. And then he said, and they were also 
the people that um, he said uh, and then he said that they were the um, the the uh, the best towards like the weak and the orphan and the handicapped uh, people um, and then and then he said that they had the quality of being the people that most restrain the oppression of their rulers, uh, which I find really fascinating. Um, it, it, it seems to me that these qualities are certainly qualities that we do find within uh, European peoples very often. Sure, and uh, it's been uh, argued that uh, although uh, Rome's republic gave way to an empire with Augustus, uh, that there continued to be uh, a Senate, and uh, in, even in the uh, Eastern Roman Empire at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, right. uh, the the uh, uh, the the Senate uh, had its own sources of authority and did advise the emperor. And uh, there's an incident in which uh, uh, the emperor Heraclius attempts to reach out to the Iranian king Khosrow II. Mm-hmm. and tried to make peace, and uh, Khosrow's unwilling. Uh, and uh, then the uh, the Senate in Constantinople sent its own envoy. Uh, and uh, so you can see that, you know, forms of consultation uh, and uh, consultative uh, governance were, were not completely absent uh, in the late Roman Empire, and I think that may be part of what... Uh, those texts that you're quoting are referring to. Hmm. Well, I I think also uh, what's fascinating about the Romans is obviously is is their incredible organizational structures, the building of their the roads and the extraordinary access that their uh, the Roman legions had to anywhere in the world. They had the rapid deployment. Uh, if if you go to the the Capitol, I, I, in the Library of Congress, on the dome of the Library of Congress, they have the, all the civilizations that have contributed to humanity's uh, furthering. And uh, the, under Rome, they have, under Islam, interestingly enough, they have physics. But under Rome, and Islam is actually the only religion mentioned there. Judea is mentioned, but I think it refers... To the the ethnic uh, aspect, but under the the Romans it says administration, and I and I think people forget just how extraordinarily uh, organized they were, and I think this is something that was gifted to the Europeans, and by extension to the Americans. I mean, we we're far more Roman than we are Greco uh, in 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 our civilizational impulses in the West. But one of the intriguing things to me is that the Prophet Muhammad uh, is reported to have said that 12,000 people uh, united will not be destroyed for lack of numbers. And just the fact that the Roman cohort had 12,000 people, it, it struck me as very interesting that he might have been alluding to that uh, incredible uh, uh, organization within the Roman legion itself. Sure, and I think also those roads that you were talking about, the paved roads, um, you know, uh, the ro- word, the Latin word for road was is via, but the paved roads, uh, the kind of royal highways, uh, uh, were the via strata. And uh, philologists actually think that strata, which went into Greek, uh, is the origin of the Arabic sirat, uh, uh, or path. And so w- when the Quran speaks about uh, sirat al-mustaqim, the straight path, it may actually be calling to mind for people that image of the royal highway that stretched from Aqaba up to Damascus, uh, and which you know was, was paved in, in, in early, in, uh, in late antique terms, uh, for, for merchants to traverse. Very, yeah, very interesting. The, um, the, 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 the battle, I mean, this war that occurred between the Near Eastern Roman Empire and the Sasanian Empire, uh, I think your book deals with this a lot, but maybe you could just talk about 
how that war really shapes our understanding of the religion itself and of the goals of the Prophet. Because one of the things that I, I mentioned to Sheikh Abdullah, and, and I hope I was doing uh, you justice, I told him that you were really making an argument in some ways that the Prophet uh, Muhammad had two major goals in mind. One was to make the world safe for religious freedom, but the other was to make it safe for commerce. And Sure. And, and, and he really thought that was just such a wonderful summation of the, the priorities because he was both a prophet and a merchant. I mean, it's very interesting that he was a merchant. And, uh, and I've thought long and hard about that, like why he was a merchant before he was a prophet. And, and, and I, my conclusion was, I think, just the extraordinary gift of the merchant to human civilization that that everything i mean we're, like right now we're talking with these extraordinary machines and we've got microphones in front of us and but it's all commerce everything is enabled by commerce you know the glasses that i'm wearing that are enabling me um to see clearer you know the clothes that are covering my nakedness all the desk i'm sitting behind everything is commerce and so the the merchant is is such an extraordinary benefit. He he he's such a benefactor of humanity, and we are the beneficiaries of commerce. And uh, and so I it it really strikes me as a wonderful way of looking at Islam, of religious freedom and and also the freedom to 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 exchange goods and services. Absolutely, and uh, the. Um... This, the findings of archaeologists uh, and uh, historians about the time of the Prophet Muhammad and the, cent- the centuries just before him in Arabia underscore your point. Because, you know, uh, the Hejaz uh, was not a place with a strong government. In fact, in some ways it had no government at all. Uh, and there was clan rule and... Uh, and so forth, and and how do you co- how do you conduct commerce in such a situation? And Mecca uh, and some of these other towns were also resource poor, so it's thought that you know you you couldn't really grow grain uh, in in the vicinity of Mecca. Uh, well, grain is really important to human diet. If you don't have grain in your diet, you're in trouble. Uh, so they had to do commerce to bring in uh, staples that they needed. But then they had this problem that there were pastoralists, there were tribal peoples who were raiding as a way of life. And so how do you do commerce under those situations of semi-anarchy? And one of the things that the uh, Arab civilization developed was this notion of sanctuary, that there were places and times when you couldn't fight, when it would be, it would make God angry if you fought. Uh, And uh, so Mecca became a haram, it became a sanctuary. It also became a hemat, which is a kind of nature sanctuary. It was a place where you couldn't hunt or, or cut down Harm trees. Harm animals or trees, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this idea of places and times of God-imposed peace uh, is wrought up with the uh, you know profession of being a merchant. And there's some early uh, Muslim historians who maintained uh, that actually commerce was a kind of pilgrimage and that uh, the merchants, to show that they were under God's protection and they were engaged in necessary commerce, when they went from one of these sanctuary cities to another for trade fairs, would actually wear the ihram. They would wear the garb of a pilgrim. Uh, So it was a, a commerce and pilgrimage were... And, and, and the security provided by the divine were all wrought up together. And I think uh, that in this great world war that was being fought between uh, the Roman Empire and the Iranians from 603 to about 630, uh, that the prophet was striving to make the Hejaz and, uh, and any place else he could, but, but he was based in the Hejaz, uh, a kind of sanctuary from that violence. I think it makes perfect sense. And I also think uh, it's one of the tragedies for me, one of the early uh, debates, the Khilaf was 
were the four sacred months, uh, were, were, were they still inviolable with Islam or or was there an abrogation? And that was something that scholars debated on. I, I actually think it would be very useful to restore the sacred months, uh, just especially given that, unfortunately, there's so many places where the Muslims are fighting each other. I mean, they even had a difficult time getting a ceasefire in Yemen during Ramadan. I mean, this is how tragic uh, things have, have come. But I think the idea of of sanctuary is such an important tradition. And, and it, as you know, it's in, in many traditions, not just in Islam. But one, one of the really fascinating things about the French occupation in Morocco is that some of the tombs of the saints were sanctuaries. So, for instance, Muli Idris in Fez was considered a sanctuary. And if somebody fleeing the French authorities went, there's a bar there. You can actually still see it today. Uh, as you go into Muli Idris, there's these, there's these bars across the roads. You, you actually kind of have to dip uh, under it a little bit. But once you entered into that, you were into a kind of sanctuary. And the French would not go in there. They would literally wait and we used to have this in our, our to, about people went into churches in the West also. They were considered sanctuaries. So the inviolability of places, uh, sacred spaces, is just a, it's a fascinating aspect of, uh, of our history as a species. And something that I think would be really worth revisiting just because there's, there's, there's so many uh, places where people don't have sanctuary, where, where the... Uh, the horrors of just aggression um, have no bounds. No, that's absolutely right. And I think, you know, there is in the Quran some kernels of uh, what we might think of as uh, as international law or laws of war, which also, I think, aimed at trying to make even conditions of conflict, you know, uh, times and places where, where people's rights were not completely deprived uh, or they, were, they weren't completely deprived of their rights. And so, uh, you know, the Quran talks about prisoners of war and, uh, and urges that they be released, uh, either, either ransomed or simply released. Right. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and I have found accounts uh, in uh, the, the 500s in the Roman Empire that particularly um, magnanimous uh, military commanders uh, would, on their own account, uh, release prisoners of war in that way. Uh, and so I think, uh, you know, now we have this discourse of locking people up uh, uh, who are enemy combatants uh, and throwing away the key and not even putting them on trial. Uh, and I, I think, in a way, the, the 500s and 600s uh, maybe had a superior attitude. I, I totally agree. Um, I, did, did you read Sven Lindqvist's uh, book, uh, the, A History of Bombing? I know uh, I haven't read that. It's a very interesting book, but one of the things he says in the, it's really kind of aphoristic. It's, it's not really a narrative. It's just he's got dates and just shows you the history of, uh, of uh, bombing. And, and he, he looks at not just aerial bombardment and things like that. But... Um, one of the things that he mentions in there is that he, he makes an argument that Abu Hanifa was the first person to legislate rules of engagement. And I, and I know that's not totally true because I, I do know that the, uh, the, uh, the early Christians had certain rules um, that, they, that they placed in just war theory and things like that. But I don't think any re- religion as early as Islam developed such a sophisticated approach to the rules of engagement because the, the prophet sallallahu for instance forbade the poisoning of wells or the poisoning of arrows actually arrow uh, poisoned arrows is not permitted so i mean that's essentially chemical warfare um, the idea of poisoning wells the idea of cutting down fruit trees uh, was also uh, prohibited um, c- killing non-combatants uh, women and children old people, and also molesting monasteries was prohibited, which is very interesting. So the monks were to be left completely alone. Yeah, that's right. And uh, the Quran, in fact, there's this very interesting verse in the Quran 
uh, which doesn't really have any context to it. Uh, and so you don't know exactly what to make of it. But uh, it, in, in, in the ch uh, chapter of pilgrimage, 22, 39 through 40, uh, it, it talks about, you know, the Muslims having to defend themselves against the pagans who had expelled them from their homes unjustly and who then had to take up arms for defensive purposes. And then it says, had God not checked one people with another, then monasteries, churches, oratories, and places of worship, wherein God is much mentioned, would have been raised to the ground. And the, the, the verse actually, you know, mentions churches and monasteries. These are Christian institutions. And I read it to suggest that... Uh, not only were the Muslims defending themselves in Medina from pagan attack, but that the Quran views that stand that they were making as protecting Christian institutions, uh, which might have been in danger had the militant pagans taken over the entire Hejaz and places like Najran or maybe southern Transjordan. Uh, but uh, as a historian, it, it just strikes me that... Uh, uh, the Quran uh, uh, sees these uh, uh, small battles that the Muslims were forced into as as defending uh, people's rights of worship uh, the, among the monotheistic religions. Right, and I I think Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayya uh, calls uh, that verse Ayat al Ma'abid, you know, the verse of of uh, sacred sacred sites. Um, and 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 I think our tradition, the scholars did argue clearly that it was an obligation. It's interesting that it uses in the verse nas, you know, that had God not used some people to defend other people. And and the early scholars said the nas here are Muslims, and then the other people are non-Muslims. You know, they would always. It was very intriguing to me how. I mean, clearly God did not say لَوْلَا دِفَعَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ الْكَافِرِينَ or something like that. It says people defending people, and we see this in life. I mean, there's times when, uh, for instance, uh, when, when uh, the Americans were uh, defending uh, the Bosnian Muslims or NATO, uh, defending the Bosnian Muslims against the Serbian Christians, um, that, that there are clearly many historical instances where some a group of people defend another group of people out of out of some virtuous awareness that it's simply the right thing to do yeah i i agree with you entirely and that's certainly the ethos of of the quran uh you know i think as centuries went on it was very easy both for people in in europe and for people in the muslim world uh to read the quran in a more and more narrow sort of way but the world in which that it's addressing, one has to remember, there weren't very many Muslims. I, um, exactly. You know, the I, the the people who made Hijra, who who, who emigrated from Mecca to mm. Medina, we, we think you know what was it, three hundred, four hundred, exactly. Uh, uh, so uh, the idea that all of these verses are about Muslims, you know doesn't make any sense. The, the, the Quran is a universalistic document anyway. It's addressing humankind. Exactly. Uh, and very explicitly. But, but anyway, there just, weren't, <laughs> there, there just weren't that many Muslims uh, to be speaking about, only them. Yeah, no, I, I would totally agree with you. And I, and I think also, I mean, part of what strikes me about the, the extraordinary desire uh, or impetus for dialogue that's in the Quran. Um, there's there's so many verses, you know, ta'aru ita kinemat and so on, and like come and let's talk, uh, let's discuss this. Uh, the the verse where the Prophet says, you know, look, one of us is is right. You know, it's like the verse actually says, say to them, you know, either I'm right or you're right, but let's let's discuss this. And so this idea of civil discourse, which is is I think it seems to me that uh, a pseudo speciation. I think the anthropologists use that term, which is a useful term. This idea now, I think the the uh, uh, the these these uh, critical theorists would say othering. You know, this idea of of 
treating somebody outside of your faith as less than human, uh, it, it seems to be a default setting of human beings. And I think primitive peoples, uh, certainly tribal peoples, uh, uh, have done this uh, throughout uh, our, our species history. But when it gets up to the nation states, especially currently with the incredible um, power, this devastating, annihilating power that we now hold as a species, and increasingly is, is proliferating amongst uh, different nations, that dialogue seems to me to be just so essential to, uh, to, to our, just the prospects of a future. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and it, it really, there's not nearly enough dialogue and there's not really enough knowledge. Uh, uh, you know, you were, with regard to Quran verses, I, I, uh, I, I really, as you can tell, love the Quran, and I, um, I, I take delight in, in certain verses. So in, it's, in, I agree in, in with, ma- yeah. It's yeah. just... In, 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 uh, uh, the, the fifth uh, chapter, verse 48, it says, We have prescribed to each of you a law and a tradition. Yeah. If God had desired, yeah, he could have made you a single community. Instead, he is testing you with regard to the revelations you received. Mm. So compete in doing good. I, it's you that, all return it's just to God. A stunning. I that's such a stunning uh, verse. I don't think any religion prior to Islam has anything even close to that ecumenicism. It's it's it really is quite stunning. And and it's also this idea of that that it's honoring. I think one of the things that really strikes me about Islamic civilization. Um, as a Western person who's who's come into the fold, um, I think in in the West uh, our impulse wherever we've gone has been to remake the world in our own image. It's it's it, it, through through Western conquest, and I I tend to I see Western conquest not different from other civilizations. I think it's a matter of scale. I think a lot of people would have done what the West did had it had the power, whether they would have done it in the same way or. Or, or not is, I mean, that's just a matter of speculation. But I think what strikes me about the Islamic civilization is that wherever it went, it had this extraordinary capacity to indigenize. And I don't know how they did it, if it was a conscientious uh, effort on the, on the part of the Muslims that arrived there, but they would adopt the clothes of the region that they moved to. The architecture would always reflect the uh, the area that they were from. They didn't. I think it's something modern Muslims really have failed uh, to do. For instance, in California, which has this wonderful traditional architecture that they call California colonial, which is is very Andalusian, Moroccan. I mean, you you know sometimes you look at if you look at a, a, a university like Stanford, and you've probably been there, it looks very Muslim uh, because of the the indigenous ar- architecture that came from Spain, but you'll have Muslims here that will build a kind of miniature Taj Mahal. And, and, and so what somebody driving by the highway, and there literally is a Taj Mahal here in, uh, in uh, the Bay Area. You know, so somebody driving by will see it. You know, it looks alien. It looks foreign. And I think this extraordinary aspect of, of, of pre-modern Muslim civilization to indigenize and just to be become part of the community that you were from. Uh, Imam al-Mawardi, the great Shafi'i um, scholar, has a book called Adab al-Din wa dunya And in that book he says that um, going against cultural norms in dress is from stupidity and utter lack of wisdom. You know, he, he, he says, min al-hamaqati wa safaha. And uh, he said that that because he said, and he, he mentioned that the ignorant people, they don't understand uh, differences. And so they might aggress upon you because they're, they, they see you as a foreign element. And this gets back to this kind of default setting of human beings, of, of uh, you know, that it's, it's something that, that, w- that we need to rise above our, our, our default settings. Yeah, people strive for status by standing out in some way. They create subcultures with uh, 
uh, distinctive dress or distinctive religious practices. Right. And if you think about the time of the Quran, you know, people would boast, uh, the Christians would boast that we have the right doctrine and they would fight among each, each other. Uh, I explain to people that uh, as well as I can that, you know, the, the, one of the big fights was over, over whether uh, Jesus was uh, uh, two natures. Homoousius or homoousius, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, but you know, uh, ultimately uh, it wasn't very different from one another. Right. And I, th I think that's it's what's so interesting is the Quran is addressing these religious communities and saying, well, it's not your doctrines or, you know, uh, your the specificities of your culture that make you special. It's it's uh, it's how much good you're right, doing. Your virtue. So yeah. if you really wanted to demonstrate that you were superior, you would compete in in, in doing dying. good. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's just such a a, a wonderfully ironic uh, way to address these these communities. Yeah. I think Gibbon said that it was remarkable that the history of Christianity hung. Uh, over the fate of a diphthong. Because <laughs> <laughs> right. it was homo or homoi. <laughs> yes, like, exactly. Yeah, same or similar. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, um, it's it's always a great uh, blessing for me to talk to you. You're, you're such an uh, enriching source uh, for our community and for the greater community. And... Um, I, I think, let me ask you one last question. Um, I read Fred Donner's book, and I know he works in a similar area. That, uh, this is such a rich area, and there aren't that many people working on it, which is the early Islam and, and the origins of Islam. Fred Donner makes an argument uh, in his Muhammad uh, Among the Believers. Is that, is that the title of that book? That's the right, yes. Yeah. And um, one of the things that w was amazing is he, he makes this argument that there's archaeological evidence that the Muslims and the Christians actually shared prayer space because there had been so many conversions and there weren't a lot of mosques, as you mentioned. And so that there were actual churches where it looked like they were actually sharing space. And this is something that I could see happening because it happens here in the United States. There are Christians that actually have opened up their churches for Muslims on Friday um, to, to pray. And so what, what do you think about just that, you know, some of the arguments that he made in that book? Yeah, well, you were making the very good point earlier uh, that, uh, you know, these lines uh, that people now draw between Christian and Muslim or Eastern and Western and so forth uh, are arbitrary and, and, and they changed over time. And I think the early Muslim uh, state uh, was, again, it was only a minority of Muslims in it. Uh, and so the vast majority of the people who lived under the, uh, uh, the commanders of the faithful or then under the Umayyads in uh, the Near East were Christian. And that right. was true probably into the 1200s uh, of the Common Era. Uh, so uh, th these were not Muslim states in the sense of right. uh, the, the, the rulers were Muslim. but the, They were administered by Muslims, the, yeah, yeah, but, but the, not the, the, yeah, the population. The, the people. And the, and the, so, you know, there's, there's every evidence that the bureaucracy of the Umayyad Empire w was run by Christians, uh, and yeah. and the Umayyad uh, caliph had a say in appointment of bishops, and there was kind of church politics, yeah. and so you have yeah. to think about these uh, places as hybrid. And of course, there were uh, also on, on the European side, uh, at certain points, a place like Valencia in Spain had a very substantial Muslim minority uh, and a Christian ruler, and various kinds of, uh, of accommodations were made. And there's, there's now my colleague, Hossein Fancy, has found very substantial evidence of Muslims fighting for Christian kingdoms uh, right. in, in Spain. So, you know, it's just, uh, it's, it's just not the case uh, that things are so black and white. Things were all mixed up. So, of uh, yeah. course, in a, in, a, in a place where Muslims were a minority uh, but had a certain position in, 
in the government and uh, in places like Syria, uh, there would be edifices that were shared for worship. Yeah, I, I are you familiar with Dr. Khalid Blankenship? Uh, I, I know Khalid well. Uh, we overlapped in Cairo back in the 70s. Okay, because Khalid to me, you know, is I he's one of the most extraordinary intellects I've ever met. And uh, I, I always chide him for not writing more. I think he, he's one of those people that would much prefer to read rather than to write. But he's just encyclopedic knowledge uh, of so many things, but certainly... Uh, Muslim history as well as uh, world history, but he he actually told me once that that it, it probably took about three hundred years before Egypt was even at fifty percent Muslim, and he said Syria was over five hundred years, and he said Andalusia actually never achieved a Muslim majority. That, those those are all true. Yeah, yeah. I mean that just struck me. I think Muslims don't understand, one, how significant religion was in the pre-modern world. It's very, it's hard for us, I, you know, it's so difficult to look at the past uh, because we tend to look at it anachronistically. I mean, if you, it, you know, if you look at, at the uh, the end of the Odyssey, you know, when, when uh, Odysseus pretty much wipes out the whole house, you know, he just kills all the suitors in a case of probably some early post-traumatic stress syndrome. But, um, but what, what, you know, when he takes all the maids and tells Telemachus to take them out and, you know, the, the maids that kind of prostituted themselves um, and just to, to kind of slaughter them, that wouldn't have been surprising to the Greek readership uh, or, or listeners to that poem because it, in, in their world it would have made perfect sense. They had soiled the, the good honor of the house but so looking back, I think for Muslims, they really don't understand that Christians did not, Christians died for their faith. You know, to, to give up your faith, they'd rather be eaten by lions than give up their faith. But I think a lot of Muslims have this fantasy that when the Sahaba showed up, it's like suddenly everybody just converted to Islam. And, and it was a very slow uh, process of transformation over, over many centuries and and still, extraordinarily, there are these amazing Christian uh, communities of, of Christianities that died out in the West because of a lot of intolerance in Western Christianity. But uh, Christianities like the Nestorians and the Jacobites and the and and the the, the Diophysites and and others. So even the Malabari uh, Nasara in uh, in in, um, I think, Madras, down in southern India, that the Portuguese were horrified to find Semitic Christians. They actually destroyed their churches. So I think uh, it's, it's, very, it's a very fascinating aspect of history. Imam Zaid Shakir um, tells Muslims, if you're going to read Muslim history, take faith vitamins. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's been marvelous uh, talking uh, with you. I, I, you did a wonderful little five-minute summation of the book on uh, a website, Amir Stein, uh, which I think there's a YouTube channel there, Amir Stein Center, which is on. And, and I, I really liked it a lot. I think it was, uh, it was just a wonderful way of capturing in a few minutes the essence of what you were talking about. But I would really recommend to any listeners out there to get a copy of Dr. Cole's book, um, which is called, I mean, you've written several books, but this book that we've been talking about, Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad, a prophet of peace amid the class of, uh, clash of empires, which is obviously the Roman and the Sasanian. Um, and I would also recommend uh, Dr. Cole's blog post. Maybe you could give the, uh, the address of your, um, of your blog post. Sure. Well, my name is Juan Cole, J-U-A-N-C-O-L-E. And if you just Google that, it, it'll come right up. It'll come up. Yeah. So, well, thank you so much. God bless you. And, uh, you know, just you, you're, you're a wonderful ally for our community and uh, a voice of sanity amidst a sea of insanity. So um, I just... Uh, 
uh, salute you for all your efforts and your your work and your amazing scholarship. Um, I, I really, really uh, admire uh, the extraordinary depths of your scholarship and your language skills and also your love of Quran, which um, I think the more you dive into the book, the more wondrous in Nasma'na Quran and Ajaba. Surely we've heard a wondrous Quran. I think the more one dives into it, the more wondrous it becomes. Well, I can't thank you enough for your generosity of spirit and your own erudition. It's been a great conversation. Okay, thank you. God bless. Thank you for listening to this podcast produced by Renovatio, a Zaytuna College publication. Our podcast brings scholars and writers of varied backgrounds into conversation about theology, philosophy, and today's ethical challenges. In an age of transience, we like to explore ideas that are timeless. Visit Renovatio at renovatio.zaytuna.edu.